Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Northwoods. Let's stand up. We're here to worship our King. If you're joining us online, we're so glad you guys are with us. Let's enjoy what He has for us today. Are you ready to worship? Come on.
He is the only one worthy of our worship. He is the only one that we sing praises to. The one who was and is and is to come. Jesus, our Savior, our Redeemer. All of our hope is found in you, Lord. Thank you for the reasons you've given us to worship you, even now. There's a reason why the curse of sin is broken. There's a reason why the darkness runs from light. There's a reason why we stand here now forgiven. Jesus is alive. We celebrate that. Yes, Lord, you are alive. There's a reason why we are not overtaken. There's a reason why we sing on through the night. Yeah. There's a reason why our hope remains eternal. Is alive. Come on, church, praise him. Praise the King. He is risen. Praise the King. He's alive. Praise the King. to hear your word would you give us the power to apply and change where we need it 
Lord God, again, also, we ask that you bless these tithes and offerings that come in in Jesus name. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. I'm Tommy Briggs. I'm one of the pastors here at Northwoods. Uh, welcome. I want to go ahead and ask our ushers to come forward. You can begin to take up the offering. If you're a guest, we hope you feel welcome today. So glad you chose to worship with us. Be sure and come back next week. Cal's going to wrap up this marriage and relationship series and teach us how to tune things out that are damaging to our relationships. You don't want to miss it. It'll be a, a great wrap up next weekend. As a reminder, some of you may not know, how do I keep up with all the hats going on at Northwoods? There's a lot of activity during the week even, not just the weekend. So one of the ways is the website, of course, but there's another one you may not be using yet, and that is our phone app. So if you wanna to go to your app store, it's free on any smartphone, download northwoods.church. And on the homepage, there's a button that says Featured News. It's updated weekly with all the activities and ministries and programs going on around here. So it's a great way to keep up with everything that's going on. Couples, listen, every relationship to work needs encouragement and you need tools in the toolbox to help you come against everything this world does to pull down at your relationship. We want you to enjoy it as God intended. So we're starting up some marriage classes Thursday night. There's two kinds. One is marriage matters. That's if you're already married. There's one for marriage prep. If you're thinking about it, even if you're not engaged, it's a great place. You'll come get great video content, you'll sit around tables and discuss things with other couples, how to apply what you're learning. Child care's provided this round. So don't miss the opportunity. Thursday night, 6.30, starts February 22nd, but we need to know you're coming to make sure we have a book and a chair for you. So go to northwoods.church slash marriage as another gift in this month of love we have something else thursday night uh, our ministry teams are canceling their prayer appointments for one reason on thursday if you're not in the classes drop by the prayer tower our teams want to pray over your relationship pray an encouragement and blessing over you you don't need an appointment stop by at the prayer tower here in peoria 7 30 to 8 30 we'd love to minister to you in that way well, since time began, mankind gathers in groups with people they have something in common with. It's in us. Finding our tribe is what helps us find our place in the world. So you don't want to miss this new series. It kicks off in two weeks, March 3rd. It's called Tribal. So it's not only a message series, but we're also highlighting our four steps, principles and concepts. This is what Northwoods does to help you find your next step in growing as a disciple of Christ. Our leadership here, we believe this is monumental in our church's future. To get strong foundation for the future, we need to build a strong body now, and this is our best way we know how. So don't miss the series, get involved, find your next step. Speaking of next steps, Pastor Cal wants to help us celebrate some new members today. Right, thank you, and, uh, I have the joy today of sharing with you the, the fact that we are adding an element to our services from here on out. Every quarter, we're going to have a moment like this where we acknowledge and celebrate those who have said, I'm going to be a part, an official part of the team at Northwoods. If you were around here when we used to have Wednesday nights, that was kind of where we celebrated new team members, but we haven't really had a place to do that. We said, you know what? We want to highlight this in the service. You know, the mission of Northwoods Community Church is to invite broken world people to experience complete freedom in Christ Jesus. And so we thrill whenever anybody comes alongside and says, that's my mission. I'm going to be one of those inviters. Yeah, well, I still have some broken things in my own life. I'm experiencing the freedom and forgiveness that Jesus brings. And I want to help bring as many people to that experience as I can. So I'm going to use my gifts around here at Northwoods to help that happen. And you see the names rolling. We have 50 people this weekend who are officially joining the team. That's worth celebrating. And that means that they've been through the four steps. You hear us talk about the four steps all the time. They've 
They found it out. That's really the on-ramp around here, how to get started, how to get connected, how to discover my gifts and how to put them into practice and become a part of the dream team. They've all done that. This church has gone for them from being that church, from being Northwoods to being my church. And so again, we celebrate them and we've had the opportunity in each one of the services this weekend to just have them stand. I wanna ask any of you who are officially joining the team this weekend, wherever you are, go ahead and stand right now. We wanna celebrate you. And then we're gonna, go ahead, stand up, stand up, stand up. I know we see all kind of across, 50 different ones. We have a little, keep standing because I wanna pray for you. But we have, I see one in the balcony up there. We have. We have a little reception planned where the staff and elders will just join them after the service. So I hope to meet you all there in a little bit. It's actually some crackers and cheese and some, some good stuff. So we, we welcome you and we celebrate you. And we wanna just pray for you right now. Would you just join me as we pray for those who are, are, are joining the team today? Father, we thank you so much for your church. I'm so grateful, Lord, that the day I said yes to Jesus Christ, I became a part of your tribe. I became a part of your church, called out ones. Church, big C, capital C. And yet I recognize today, Lord, it'd be impossible for that entire church to gather at one location at one time, like we're gonna do in heaven one day. But for the time being on earth, you ordained that if we were part of a church, we would find a local tribe to which we could belong. And I'm so thankful, Lord, for the unique church that you've raised up here at Northwoods, for the unique assignment and mission that you've given us. And it's exciting whenever you call out people to say, hey, I want you to be a part of that. I'm grateful for these who have answered that call. And I pray, Lord, as they add their gifts to the mix, their prayers, their resources, as they own this mission, Lord, you'd make them inviters. You would help them to bring other people who need your touch in their own broken world. I pray that you'd grow them up here. I pray that you'd help establish them more fully in the faith, that they would protect the unity of the church, that they would just share their gifts in this church, and that they would help to make this church a greater force for the kingdom of God because they're a part of it. We're so grateful for them. And so I pray your blessing in their lives and your protection over their lives. And Father, I pray that you would use the fruit of their life and their lips to bring many more broken world people to an experience of the forgiveness and freedom that they can find only in Jesus Christ. And we celebrate that commitment today in Jesus' mighty name. And everyone said, amen. Come on, one more time. Thank these guys. I'm grateful for you. Go ahead, let's everybody stand. And guys, I don't know that I can adequately convey to you how important it is, particularly before we receive the Word of God, that we allow Him to open our hearts. And one of the ways He does that is when we worship Him. It's like God's attracted to that. He goes, oh, I hear my people calling on me. I think I'm going to go meet with them. And that's why he wants every one of us to worship with all we have, to sing with all we have. You say, Kel, I don't sing very well. God don't care. That's why he said, make a joyful noise. Even if it's noise, your noise attracts him. Your noise says, you know what? I want to come and meet with you today. I want to touch your heart. And so as we sing this song that, that says, you know, it's, in essence, we're coming to his altar. We're going to find his arms open wide. He's ready to meet us where we are today. You let him know you're ready to be met. Amen? Come on, let's sing together. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of the sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus. 
Jesus is calling thank you for the life you've given us today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for worshiping.
the late at night laundry, but it's more compulsive. She has to do it. I'm gonna be honest why. I love that he goes six days a week to the gym. I mean, like he's playing full court basketball, so his clothes are sweaty. That's sitting in the basket. She can't take it. Why He's would you so get? Cute. Why would you get a dog? He pees. He poops everywhere. He barks in the middle of the night at the wind. He costs a lot of money. This dog has cost more in healthcare than I have in like the past ten years. Uh, probably not putting mail all over the counter, <laughs> and he doesn't open up the mail. It's junk mail. It sits there. <laughs> I am a wallflower, so I don't appreciate lots of attention and eyes on me. You know that whole wallflower thing? <laughs> I don't care. We can go like this. <laughs> you knew that was coming. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You're gonna have to edit that. This morning I went to brush my teeth and you know the, the cap wasn't on all the way, so the cap's all full of toothpaste. And... I don't have time. To... <laughs> That's a daily thing. I don't even know if he can do this but his sneezes are phenomenally loud. They're terrifying. I don't know if he can change it or not, but they're scary. I, I've heard the comments <laughs> shake the rafters. I, I don't know. I don't know if it's that bad. Also, Hope does this thing where she like dresses the dog up in multiple outfits. It's great. People love it. Easter Bunny even has a tail. Doesn't it look like he loves it? Santa. He loves attention. <laughs> it's it's awesome. One area that I think he could tone it down would be, you know, the handlebar mustache on occasion. And a wooden bow tie. My creepy. friends liked it. And red pants. <laughs> and flowered shirts. I would wish you'd bring it down just a little bit. I'm all out of love. I'm so lost without you. I'm... Don't you? Come on, give it up for our, our couples. <laughs> our couples and the one that's looking to be a couple. <laughs> Great to see you guys today. And again, we just want to welcome all of our other campuses, our online community. Let's give it up for them. Great to have you guys with us. You know, we're in this marriage series. Before I get going, uh, I just want to give a commercial for those of you couples that you might be ready for the Israel experience. And I uh, want to just highlight the fact that next week after each service, uh, we're going to be uh, getting together anybody who's interested in going to Israel. I call it the Israel experience. We're going to start calling it that because it's a whole lot more than a tour. You talk to anybody who's been there, it's an experience. I can take you some folks who say, my life is different today because I went. Some things God stirred in me, some things God began to change in me. It's an experience. And we're going again November 4 through 16. Now last year, now I always like to limit it to one bus. Last year we could have had two full buses. So we gave those people who are on the waiting list an opportunity to sign up first. We already have 25 people ready to roll. The bus can take 50. So if you want to be one of those next 25 to fill up the bus, you come next week. Okay, after the service, we'll have a short time together where I'll go through uh, just some of the details of that trip, get you excited about going, but this might be one of those times you say, honey, we're going. Let's, let's do this together. Be a great experience for your marriage as well. So speaking of making music in your marriage, Susan and I returned last Monday from a week of 80-degree weather in sunny Bradenton, Florida, where uh, we would just enjoy the pool by day and gospel music by night. Susan humored me for the gospel music part. But uh, we, yeah, every night there was gospel music. That's kind of why we were down there. And while we were blessed to attend a great church in Bradenton last Sunday, we were also blessed to tune in online. We try to do that every time we're away. We want to check out what's going on back here. And we got to hear our son John do a great job in kicking off our marriage series last weekend. And you may remember he talked about certain critical elements we need to turn up in our marriage. Things like listening, like encouragement, like friendship. And now today we want to just kind of flip this around and look at some areas where we need to tone things down. That's part of making music too. Issues that can ruin our marital harmony if we just let them run wild. This is what Solomon meant when he said in Song of Songs 2 and verse 15. Now some of your Bibles call it Song of Solomon. Be that as it may, he's talking about the love relationship between 
a husband and wife. It actually gets R-rated. You want to read some R-rated in the Bible? Check out Song of Songs. Here's what he says in chapter 2 and verse 15. Catch for us the foxes, the little foxes that ruin the vineyards. He was talking about the little pests, which if you allow them to run uncontrolled through the vineyard of your marriage, will seriously curtail the kind of marital harmony you enjoy and will lead to a harvest of wine instead of wine. Two ways to spell it. And if you're getting a harvest of the first, W-H-I-N-E in your marriage, you better listen up today. I'm going to give you a lot of insight on how you can change that around and get a little better harvest. Get the W-I-N-E, right? I want to frame all of what I say today within the context of learning how to resolve marital conflict in a healthy way. We could call this how to have a good fight because you're going to have fights. A good fight is where you come out the other side better than what you were and you did it in the right way. You fought in the right way, right? So we're talking about how to resolve marital conflict in a healthy way because I can almost guarantee you that if your marriage is off key or out of harmony today, the likelihood is that there is some form of unresolved conflict in your relationship, which is likely due to a history of conflict resolution done poorly such that one or both of you have given up hoping for anything better. And you've learned to just say, well, if I say anything, he'll just get mad, so there's nothing I can do about it. It's going to make things worse, right? And so we leave these little issues unaddressed. They may not be little, but they're, they're the little foxes that are destroying the vineyards. We leave them unaddressed, in which case, while well, God designed us to enjoy the palace in our marital relationship, many of us are stuck in a prison of despair or we've fallen into a pit of discord. And by marital palace, I'm, I'm talking about the kind of personal relational harmony that God intended for each one of us, not only in our relationships, but primarily in our marital relationship, where we, we are not only totally aligned with him, because we're aligned with him, we're aligned with one another, we have harmony with one, one another, we have peace, we have joy, we are free from accusation because of our heart with your alignment with God, such that we're not touchy about things, we're virtually unoffendable. Are you virtually unoffendable in your relationship with your spouse? Or are you easily offended? See? And not only that, but we, we, we just inspire confidence in one another about who God has made us to be and what he's called us to do. That's the marital palace. Relationships at their best. And yet, that's something far different than what many experience if they're in a marital pit or prison. And those of you who have been at Northwoods maybe longer than 20 years might remember a concept we talked about quite often around here in the early days, drawn from a book by author Scott Peck, and it was entitled The Different Drum. In it, Peck suggests that God designed us to yearn for open, honest, authentic relationships, or what he called communal relationships, and these types of relationships symbolize the palace with all of those things I said about it, aligned with God, harmony, joy, peace, virtually unoffendable, inspiring confidence in one another. That's what God designed us for. That's the palace. Relationships at their best. But when we experience conflict, many of us opt for what he called he, uh, Peck calls peacekeeping instead of truth-telling. And we settle for what he labeled pseudo-communal relationships. Pseudo meaning false or fake. It's like we hear a lot about fake news these days. A lot of us learn how to fake it in our relationships. So the pseudo-communal relationship is best represented by a prison. God wants us to experience the palace, but because we think in terms of peacekeeping, well, if I say anything, it'll just make it worse. 
instead of truth telling, we end up in the prison. Now, these types of pseudo communal relationships represent marriages, family relationships, friendships that are strictly surface level. God forbid that anyone should ever say anything unsafe. There's sort of a built in understanding that we're not to discuss misunderstandings, reveal hurt feelings, air our frustrations, or ask difficult questions. The underlying rule in pseudo community is it comes from a song that some of us learned a long time ago don't rock the boat, don't tip the boat over, right? Remember that song? It's kind of like keep the peace at all costs. That's the rule. Don't disturb the peace. But the problem is that for all of our peacekeeping efforts, it's a false peace. It's pseudo community. False peace. Misunderstandings still arise, they just never get resolved. Feelings are still hurt, they just never get shared. Offenses still occur, they just never get dealt with. Trust still breaks down, it just never gets talked about. And what happens over time, what was designed to be a palace relationship becomes a prison of de detachment, distrust, and bitterness because, you might want to write this down, it is the nature of pseudo-communal relationships to, to deteriorate over time. They don't get better. You think you're keeping the peace and really what you're doing is causing the relationship further damage. Secret agendas of hurt and misunderstanding then lead to relational breakdown. Feelings of love begin to die. And guys, it's a sad story today of far too many marriages, family relationships, and friendships. So what is the answer? How do we move out of the prison or the pit, as the case may be? Because some of you, we're going we're to see this today. You, you, you may have been in a palace and you say, I don't know that mine's really a prison. Well, maybe you can dig a little hole over here and say, I just feel like we've gotten off base and we've fallen into a pit for a little bit. The question is, how do I get from here or here to here? And I wish I had an easy answer, but I'm going to help you with that today. Peck said the only way is through chaos. We call it for years around here the tunnel of chaos. Some of you remember that term. It's in the tunnel of chaos that hurts get unburied and put on the table. It's in the ten tunnel of chaos that hostilities get re revealed, that tough questions get asked, tough conversations are had. It's here we learn to do what Ephesians 4.15 says. Instead, and, and I want you to see this, it, it doesn't say instead, keeping a false peace at all costs. It says, speaking the truth in love. We will, in all things, grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. That's what God wants. He wants us to grow up in our relationship with him. He wants us to grow up in our relationship with one another. And the way we do that is by speaking the truth in love. And the only way we're going to get from the prison to the palace in our marital relationships is if we learn how to speak the truth in love rather than opting for false peace. And because this tunnel can be so scary and chaotic, it's important that we learn how to tone down those things that keep us from experiencing healthy conflict resolution in our marriages. And so what I want to do today is I want to give you rules for navigating the tunnel. And those of you who are note takers, get your notes out. I'm going to give you a boatload of stuff. Not all of these may necessarily apply to you, but at least one or two, you're going to say, oh boy, I could use that one right there. And guys, whether or not it's for resolving conflict, these are just great principles for how we communicate in our relationships. All right? And so with each one, I'm going to kind of give you the rule, which will have something of a warning in it. Here's, what you, here's the rule, and you've got to kind of be aware of this. And then I'm going to give you the antidote. Here's, here's how you work this out while you're in the tunnel. All right? And for some of you, I want to say, you may need to do this work with a counselor. How do I know whether I need to go to a counselor? Well, the question is, how long have you been stuck in the prison? Have you tried to get out? And your answer is, well, we just keep going back there. When we do this, we just end up fighting. That's probably an indication that you need a counselor who can be something of a coach in that tunnel so he can help keep you moving forward. And understand, you're, depending on how long you've been in the prison, you're not going to get the palace in one big step. 
I remember I did this with some leaders a few years ago, and we had to talk at the end of the day about how we felt, and, and it really got kind of like negative. I don't feel like we accomplished anything, blah, 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 blah. And I said, guys, can I explain to you the tunnel of chaos? I feel good about what we did today because we're no longer in the prison. We're not all the way through the tunnel, but we've taken some good steps into the tunnel on the way to the palace. And it just framed a perspective of, you know what? We really are better off today because we're moving towards where we want to be. All right? So with that understanding, let's look at the rules that can help us. Rule number one, tone down accusations and judgments. Really got to do this when we're in that tunnel of chaos. The antidote is, rather than accusation and judgments, invite the Holy Spirit to search your own heart. And you should put search your heart first. So critical, I cannot emphasize it enough because ultimately conflict resolution cannot happen unless at least one of the parties involved wants it to happen bad enough that he or she is willing to quit insisting on their own rights long enough to examine where they might be wrong. Right? Get in a tunnel, it's all about how the other person did me wrong. Kind of like a wife who said, you know, my husband just never acts like he does anything wrong. Oh, no, 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 I was wrong one time. It's so when I thought I was wrong, and I found out it wasn't. Now, when would you like to do business with that guy, right? No, when both parties come into that tunnel and just kind of punching and swinging and convinced that they're right, there aren't going to be any breakthroughs because, guys, it's a law of the tunnel. Breakthrough will not happen for us until break up happens in us. And can I tell you which one of those God's most interested in? Oh, he wants to bring the breakthrough. But he really want to help, help, he wants to help a little break up happen in us so that we're not all focused on making accusations and judgments about somebody else. We're saying, Lord, what needs to change in me? This is why David wrote in Psalm 139, 23, and 24. I've given you this verse many times. I pray it every day of my life. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in my wife. Would you do that, Lord? It's not what he says, right? That's how we want to pray it. See if there's any offensive way in me. And God, if there is, you get me back on the path. You lead me in the way everlasting. This is what Jesus was talking about when he said, you know, when we're, when we're working through conflict situations, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye, in your wife's eye, in your husband's eye, and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? I brought along my Louisville plank today. Here, young lady, you want to just stand up for a moment? Come on, one of you, right? Because, you know, I've been looking at that speck in your eye, and it just bothers me so much, and I want to help get that out. Can I help get that out today? You see, I start trying to help get that out. What am I doing? I'm beating you with the bat. Go ahead. Give her a hand. She did a good job there. Now, did you see what I'm saying? This is, isn't that crazy? It's one of the funniest pictures in the Scripture that Jesus gave us of a guy with a log in his eye. He said, can I help you with that little piece of sawdust you got there? And the whole time we're beating the person with our big old log or our big old bat. That's really going to help in the tunnel, right? This is, why, this is why Jesus said in Matthew 7, verse 5, first take the plank out of your own eye, and then you'll see clearly remove the speck from your brother or your spouse's eye. See this young lady here? She wouldn't have to ask me whether I've taken the bat. She knows I've taken the bat because she's no longer getting whacked by it when I'm trying to help her with her speck. And she's willing to let me help her with the speck because I'm not using a bat on her anymore. That makes sense? That's what we need when we go into the tunnel. Guys, you take time to prepare your heart like that. Search me, O oh Lord. Get the plank out of my eye. As you're working through conflict, you prepare your heart like that, asking God to show you what you need to work on and, 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 and what needs to change with you. And I'm telling you, it will pave the way for breakthroughs in your life because the breakup that's happened in you. In his book entitled The Peacemaker, author Ken Sand tells of a conflict that had arisen between Steve and Bill. And I'm just using this between friends, even though it relates to, to marriage as well. But Steve had had his house built by Bill 
Bill the Builder had done some things apparently that were wrong. He wasn't taking responsibility for it. Steve was so upset that even though they were brothers, Steve had him in court, sued him. Bill countersued, which resulted in months of legal, legal discoveries, thousands of dollars in attorney fees. And during a deposition, one of the attorneys finally realized that a contra what a contradiction he was watching. Two prominent businessmen, both of whom claimed to be Christ followers, growing increasingly bitter and hostile as each continued to justify his own actions and focus on the other's faults. The attorney's concern led him to suggest that the men submit their dispute to Christian conciliation, to which both were initially reluctant but eventually agreed, which meant that sometime later, Steve and Bill met with a panel of Christian conciliators, which included a builder, a businessman, and an attorney. And I want to tell you, every time they would get together, it was just more of the same. It was blaming, it was refusing to take ownership, and, and, and I mean, it was wearing out the conciliators. They just kept working at it. Finally, one day, they said, guys, we got some Bible verses. We think it'd be great if you just get your hearts before the Lord, read through these verses, ask God to search you and this type of thing. And finally, one, one day, Bill began to see that he had not been acting in a God-honoring way. He also realized that he was providing his attorney and his family with a terrible example of how a follower of Christ should deal with conflict. And as this insight penetrated his heart, Bill experienced a shattering of his hard-heartedness. Break-up happened in him, paving the way for breakthrough to happen through him. So you can imagine, it's been months and months and months, we're getting nowhere, here comes the next meeting. I'm sure the conciliators are going, oh man, more of the same, here we go, right? Until Bill gets there and asks to make a statement this day, right up front. And he begins with a humble heart to say, I am so sorry. I wanna ask Steve's forgiveness. I acknowledge that I did some things wrong and, and, and here's what I want to do to repair the house. Showed Steve a checklist that he had developed to prevent similar problems in future projects. And can I tell you, something began to happen in Steve's heart because he was no longer get, getting hit by the baseball bat. All of a sudden, Steve's heart breaks. And he says, Bill, you know, this is really more my fault than yours. I'm too much of a perfectionist, and I've done a terrible job of communicating with you. My wife can tell you how difficult I can be. I think I need your forgiveness more than you need mine. And as you can imagine, the rest of the folks in the room sat there absolutely stunned at what they were witnessing. After months of hostile litigation, weeks of frustrating mediation, the breakthrough had come because one person had been willing to humble himself before God and the person with whom he was experiencing conflict. Bill even went to Steve's wife to apologize for the inconvenience and stress he had caused her, and they too were reconciled. But guys, what a beautiful example of conflict resolution done God's way. And it's made me wonder how many thousands of dollars could be saved, how many conflicts resolved, how many marriages and families salvaged, how many lawsuits left unfiled, how many attorneys left unemployed, were we simply to learn how to pursue conflict resolution God's way. And that's not to put a dig in on any of you attorneys. Okay, we appreciate what you do, but I'm just saying, it all begins when we tone down our accusations and judgments and instead invite the Holy Spirit to search our hearts. Start there if you're gonna go in the tunnel. Here's rule number two. Tone down the voice of conflict avoidance because you're gonna hear it every time there's a need to get in the tunnel. It's gonna say, don't go there, it's just gonna be worse, you know it, you've tried before, nothing good's gonna happen, it's just gonna make things worse. And you're settling for false peace. The antidote is to arrange a face-to-face -face meeting as soon as possible. This is exactly what Jesus said in Matthew 18 and verse 15. If your brother, if your wife, if your husband sins against you, hurts you, wounds you in some way, go and show him his fault. Remembering, you've taken the bat out of your eye first. Go show him his fault just between the two of you, which means don't get on the phone and talk to mom about it. Don't go telling the kids, you all see what that idiot did again today. Just between the two of you. Go show him his fault. 
In other words, as soon as you're aware that there's a conflict that needs to be resolved, arrange a face-to-face -face meeting. And guys, we're talking about conflict. This is why you don't do conflict through texting and tweeting and email face-to-face -face so you can read the eyes and the body language. All right? As soon as you're aware that something's off, as soon as possible, that just means you don't let years go by, months go by of buried hostilities. That's why the Bible says, Ephesians chapter 4 and 26, do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. That is saying, deal with your hurt feelings ASAP, as soon as possible. There's one lady who was talking about this and said, we made a pact when we got married that we would never go to bed while we were mad at each other. She said, currently we haven't slept for the last four nights. You know, kind of <laughs> destroys the point, right? What God is saying is deal with your conflict as soon as possible and you'd be a lot less likely to lose sleep over it or to wear out the outer edges of your mattress sleeping as far away from each other as you possibly can. Let me just add with this one. When I say deal with the conflict as soon as possible, I cannot overemphasize the importance of assessing the timing. By this I mean do it at a time when both of you are bringing your best emotional reserves to bear on the issue at hand. The tunnel deserves your best emotional energy, not your worst. Susan and I learned a long time ago that when we are both tired, after 10 o'clock at night, after 9 o'clock at night, not the time to deal with finances and friction. Let's bring our best energies to the moment so we don't just end up fighting about this stuff. Right? So you, make, you decide on a time when you can both bring your best energies. Another thing is, you know, he's trying to get out the door in the morning. He's already running a little bit late, got a big meeting. That's not the time to be shouting behind him. I sure hope we talk about this sometime, right? You know, really sets him up for a good day. No. Hey, we will talk about this, but let's set a time that we both agree on where we can bet, bring our best emotional reserves to the issue at hand. Rule number three, tone down negativity. Resolving conflict is hard enough. Getting into that tunnel is hard enough. None of us like to go there. It, is helped, it, is, it isn't helped by sarcasm and negativity. So your, your husband, your, your wife comes to you and says, honey, we need to talk about this. It, it's not helped when you go, well, a lot of good that's going to do. Not going to help anything. Just going to make everything work. Oh, wow. Really? Here's the antidote that can help us maybe get in that tunnel. Affirm the relationship and your desire for what could be. Affirmation establishes an environment in which one is much more likely to hear what is being said. You tell me which approach is more likely to, to, to bear positive results, right? Well, I don't really want to talk about this because I don't think it's going to do any good. Besides, I don't really care if we were living in a prison, been that way all my life. Life would be better without you in it, right? That's really going to get you to the palace, right? That's probably where the guy was living. I, no, no lie. I, I saw a bumper sticker on a truck one day. I almost want to go talk to the guy. It said, uh, wife and dog missing, reward for the dog. And I, want, I, I wanted to go say, I understand why your wife's missing. <laughs> How about approach B? Think about this. I know I don't like going in the tunnel. It's not going to be easy. But does it make a difference when I come and say, honey, I want more than anything else that palace relationship that God's designed us for. And I feel like something's just kind of thrown that off. Can we talk about that? Who isn't going to say, wow, I kind of want that too. Right? You're, you're affirming the person and, 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 and the palace that you're designed for and what you want for the relationship. I think most of us would admit that we'd have a far easier time hearing someone else's hard truth if it were delivered in an atmosphere of affirmation rather than an atmosphere of antagonism. If it was delivered with, with a picture of, I want to get to the palace. See? 
And let me say it this way, if we can't begin with affirmation, then that's a red flag that we're not prepared for the tunnel. Don't go in there if you can't begin with affirmation. One of the ways you know your heart is prepared properly is if you can begin the process with affirmation. And then, let me just add this, as you are working on and talking about the issues in the tunnel, toning down negativity means this, no pointing out the problems unless you're ready to offer positive solutions. Anybody can tell you about the problems. Boy, that's just like a wet rag on your heart, isn't it? Wow, great, thanks for giving me the problems. Now I wanna hear positive solutions. You know, you know, honey, when you say that or you do this, this is what it makes me feel like. And we don't just stop there. Here's what I would prefer you do. I'm like, wow, thank you. I'm glad to know that. I can do that. I'm gonna work hard at doing that. See, we're giving positive solutions. Rule number four. Tone down the snowball effect. <laughs> what do I mean by that? And we all do it. The snowball effect is where you allow issue after issue to be rolled into the discussion until you're no longer dealing with the issue you set out to deal with. So let's say my wife wants to deal with something I said or did that hurt her. She tells me, and instead of my saying, honey, I am so sorry I did that, forgive me, and I'm gonna work hard to never do that again, I instead say, well, you want me to talk about what you did or what you said that made me do that? Do you see what we've just done? Well, let's just roll a whole other snowball into this deal. So we got so many issues going on now that we don't even know what we're talking about anymore. And a person says, doesn't do any good to talk about it. Here's, here's the antidote. Guys, this will help you in any relationship. and It'll certainly help with the tunnel. Identify the real issue and you deal with only one issue at a time. When another issue comes up, you go, no, 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 wait, wait, wait. If you want to talk about that when we're done with this one, we will. But we're not talking about that until we get done talking about this. That's where a counselor could help. Because see, he's sitting there, he's seeing the snowball happen. He goes, whoa, we're not talking about that right now. We're talking about this. See? You've got to stay on course and not just let that snowball get going. Again, this is why it is so important that we have thought through and we be able to articulate our issue with another person so that we can stay focused on what the real issue is. Here's how it works for a lot of couples. Come on, we've all done this somewhere at some time in some way in our marriage. The wife who feels neglected, ignored, uh, due to her husband's work schedule. She's sitting there at the coffee table as on this particular morning, he's enjoying his newspaper and he's sipping his coffee. She, again, she's feeling neglected, ignored as of late, rather per, you know, perturbed that even when he is home, he's preoccupied with other things. So here he is this morning hiding behind the newspaper rather than talking to her. But because she's not in touch with the real issue and doesn't know how to articulate what she's feeling, she snaps with, with just enough edge so he'll notice it. Do you always have to slurp your coffee that way? Now, come on, is his coffee really the issue right now? But because he apparently hasn't yet learned to discern that there's something deeper going on, he says, well, if you don't like the way I drink my coffee, you can go in the other room. How many of you know now the war is on? Right? And she snaps back, something like, all right, I will. Besides, I can have just as good a conversation with the wall in there as I can out here, right? They trade verbal volleys a few more times before he storms out the door, glad that he can escape to work where he doesn't have to put up with her nagging about his slurping his coffee, and she resigns herself to another day of anger and loneliness in the prison. You understand, guys? Their relationship feels like a prison, but it has nothing to do with slurping his coffee. How many of you will admit that you have fought over stupid things like that before? Come on. We got honest couples in here? So we fought over some stupid things before. I want to tell you today, bless that stupid thing. But here's what I'm saying. Learn to look beneath the stupid thing for what the real issue is. Because the stupid thing is highlighting there's something that needs to be talked about here right now. Maybe we need to identify it and get after it. And when you identify it, again, the rule is you deal with only one issue at a time. Then, rule number five, while you're doing that, you tone down personal attacks. 
It's an old story about a sheep herder in Wyoming who would observe the behavior of wild animals during the winter. For example, packs of wolves would sometimes sweep into the valley and they would attack these bands of wild horses. And whenever they attacked, these horses would put their heads together in a circle and start kicking outward like this, keeping the wolves away. However, when that same pack of wolves would attack a herd of wild jackasses, Jackasses would do the exact opposite. They would put their heads on the outside so they could watch the wolves, and then they'd start kicking in, and they would be kicking each other. And it's an example of when we are dealing with conflict, we can choose to be as wise as the wild horses or as foolish as the wild jackasses. Here's, here's the antidote. You know, because... The Bible never tells us to kick each other. Attack the problem, not each other. The Bible says in Ephesians 4 and verse 29, don't let, what's the word? Any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. That's saying don't you attack each other. Don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what's helpful for building others up. Is this going to help get us to the palace? So it It's according to their need that it may benefit those who listen. That verse is saying, don't kick each other. Attack the problem. And just a couple of tips here with this one, because I know we would probably all do it. No getting historical. (laughs) You know what that means, you know? A guy was saying to the counselor, you know, every time we try to work on an issue, she gets historical. He said, no, you mean hysterical. He said, no, I mean historical. It's like, honey, you remember you did that 15 years ago. Listen, there's no, if, if you've forgiven something, you've talked about it, you've settled it, there's no going back and dragging it out. That's getting historical. Doesn't help the relationship, primarily in the tunnel. Secondly, no, you make me mad statements. That's really giving a lot of power to other people. Because you know what? Nobody can make you mad without your consent. You choose to get mad. Now, they may trip your triggers. I understand that. But you need to learn how to make, in the tunnel, it's better if you make I feel statements. Not you make me so mad. You know what? Honey, when you say things like that, it makes me feel this way. I feel angry. I feel detached. I feel put down. See, now you're owning your feelings rather than putting it on somebody else for making you mad, right? And then keep never and always out of it. You know how that one works. Somebody says, you, you, you never do that. What's the response to that? Oh, I'm sure I never do that, right? Really helps us get towards the palace. Or, you know what, you always do that. And then, oh, I'm sure I always do that, right? Now we got the snowball going. Some of you are laughing, you know this. Here, here's the rule. Never is never helpful. And always is always inflammatory. So don't use them. They're not good words for the tunnel. Tone down any personal attacks and ask rather, how can I attack the problem without attacking my spouse? Rule number six, tone down the volume. One wife said, my husband is just too temperamental. Whenever we have a conflict, he's about 90% temper and 10% mental. And that's the danger when the volume gets turned up. We, we just, it's all temper. Not a whole lot of thought going on anymore. What's the antidote? You call a timeout when emotions are running high. And guys, I've seen this one violated to the detriment. It's just made things worse. But I, I mean, there, there's just some of us that it's like when we're fighting, we got to solve it now. How many of you done that, right? We're going to sit right here until we get to solve. You know, no, no, you're going to kill each other. No, you, want to, you want to be in a place where you're practicing what Proverbs 15, 1 says, a gentle answer turns away wrath. So are you in a place where you're giving a gentle answer or you got the emotions worked up so much that you guys are fighting now? A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. So we're, when we're in that tunnel... The rule is that whenever the volume gets beyond our normal speaking voice, that is a sign that a timeout is warranted. 
And we either agree to resolve this thing without turning up the heat or the volume, or we agree to come back at a different time when both of us are in a place of emotional stability again. We're not running wild with, with anger and the volume's all ratcheted up. There's another. Rule number seven, tone down one-way conversations. Just very quickly uh, on that one, we got to understand that the tunnel can never just be a one-way conversation. We always have to be inviting feedback. And I know this is a tough one for a lot of us. We'd love it if we could just get in the tunnel. I've heard people almost go in there sometimes going, I'm just so glad I get to go in. I'm going to give them my hard truth, man. And they're going to listen. Kind of like, oh, really? It's all about you getting to spew your stuff, and they're just supposed to listen. I thought this was a dialogue. I thought this was more than just a one-way conversation because you know what? They may have some hard truth to share with you. Generally, where there's conflict, there's two people involved. And so if we're going to get away from one-way conversations, there has to be a place where we come to a point and we say, you know, I want to be aware of anything you feel I might have done to contribute to this problem. Is there anything you need to say to me? And we invite the feedback. More than once, giving someone the opportunity to share their feelings with me has opened my eyes to areas of defect in a relationship that I had no idea I was directly contributing to. So we can't just have it, you know, it's a one-way relationship. Let me give you this rule eight and we're, we're finished. And whereas rule number one is probably, you know, when I started up there, say get rid of the, the judgments, the negativity, invite God to search you. This is really the other sandwich. If there's, if there's two buns that we're putting the rest of the sandwich together on, it's the number one and number eight that really belong there as the bookends. Rule number eight is tone down quick fix advice giving. It's so easy to just want Again, want to do one big step, just take my advice and we'll be through the tunnel. Now, nah, the tunnel has some emotion involved in it, some hearts that need to be restored. So here's the deal. The antidote is first off for empathetic understanding. And guys, this isn't just, as I said, this isn't just for uh, resolving conflict. This is just a great principle for connecting in relationship anyway. And God had to teach me that again just a few weeks ago. Because I, I don't know that we ever get done to where we say, oh, I'm just great at this. We, we're always going to have a little bit more to learn. And so knowing that I was going to be traveling, I knew Susan and I were going to be going to Florida. Next Sunday, we head to uh, another Israel trip where I'm taking the Legacy 5 and about 70 other people on a tour of Israel. So I'll be gone for another 8, 10 days. I just knew I wasn't going to have time for about a five or six week period to get home to see my father. So on January 31st, I, was, I, I thought, I've got to make a run, see my dad, because I may not get there until maybe the middle of March or whatever. And so I was headed to Archibald, Ohio, up there on Route 80. My wife was headed to Indianapolis with Catherine. She was going to stay with Catherine's children until I could pick her up on Super Bowl Sunday. Then we were flying to Florida and this type of thing. But we were driving in separate vehicles at separate places across the country when the call came informing Susan that she had the early stages of, of breast cancer. My daughter was calling me going, Dad, I don't know what to do with her. I've never seen her like this before. And she really didn't want to talk to me either. And I'm getting kind of mad. You know, I, she needs some of my advice right now. Now, guys, understand, I, I talked to Susan about this, that I was going to be sharing this. No way to disparage her. I can't imagine what it's like to get the C word. Some of you have gotten that. You know, it can take you into a black hole real quick. That's kind of where Susan was for a moment, for about a day. I talked to her that night. Now, again, I'm, I'm in my, my coaching role, just trying to give her you know, tips and techniques for, come on, honey, we got to snap out of this. So I met with my dad the next day. We took him to lunch along with some of my brothers, and I decided, you know what? I think I need to take the long way home and head down through Indianapolis rather than just blowing on home. I think I probably need to stop and see my wife. Way to go, Cal. You're probably thinking good. <laughs> I wasn't sure she wanted me to come, not because she didn't want me to come. She just said, he doesn't need to come, you know. I said, I'm going to be okay. But I'm on my way down there for about two and a half hours. I'm thinking, God, what do I need to, what do, I need to do to help get Susan out of this black hole? You know, I want, I, want 
I'm a pastor. I like to give advice, right? About 10 minutes away from getting to my daughter's house, and I, you know, had one of those moments, another God moment that I'll never forget. I was talking with one of my elders on the phone. We talked about a number of things, and before he hung up, he said, can I pray for you? I don't remember what he prayed, but I remember it's like God came in that car And he touched my heart with a compassion that helped me to understand what my wife was going through. So that by the time I pulled up in front of my daughter's house, I didn't have any answers. I just had tears. And I had a heart full of compassion for my wife. And I walked in and little Maddie came running, Papa. Susan didn't know I was coming. She was just around the corner of the playroom and she's sitting down there with the one little one in her arms and, and our oldest granddaughter, Avery, was playing, and I looked down at her, and she looked up, and I could tell her eyes were streaked like she hadn't slept very much, and she'd been. I said, honey, I just needed to hug my wife. We talked about this the other day. I'm not going to forget that hug the rest of my life. There was, there was something so amazing in that hug for I don't know how long it was, but I also knew that there was something coming from me into her. It was the compassion of God, and there was something just going between us in that moment that we knew we love each other like, oh, my goodness. I was just, honey, I'm so sorry. I don't have answers. I, honey, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. We're going to get through this, you know. And after a couple of minutes, I just kind of, I said, you know, I thought maybe you needed to go to Starbucks today. That's her favorite, you know. And I saw her smile. It's like there wasn't the black hole anymore. She said, I would love that. And guys, can I tell you that over the next hour, just the free flow of conversation, even maybe a little bit of advice giving, but it was now wanted. It wasn't coming out of a heart of just trying to fix you. It was coming out of a heart that had already sensed her pain. And I mean, when I dropped her off there an hour later and I needed to head home and we just prayed together, it was a total different situation. I go, thank you, God, and thank you for an elder that touched my heart, and God touching my heart, he helped me understand my wife's heart. Oh, man, I wish I could just live like that. And I was like, God, would you help me learn how to lead more from the heart instead of always from the head in my relationships, primarily in my marriage relationship? I'm going to guess that some of you are right there with me. Not that we're trying to get it wrong. It's just, man, we just need that kiss of God on our hearts sometimes. It changes everything. And so I thought, let's, let's take a simple prayer and make this our prayer each day this week in our marriage. In fact, I, I believe this prayer will help saturate the tunnel with love and keep you headed in the palace. I, I, I didn't know I was going to do this, but I'm going to write. I, I want to ask the first lady of this church, honey, you come on up here with me, okay? We're going to do this prayer together. And when she's coming up here, will you just thank God for this woman of God? <laughs> come here. I couldn't do what I do. I was called of God to preach the gospel. She was called of God to help me preach the gospel. And I'm so thankful for her. And we love each other with all our heart. But here's what we're praying, and, and I wanna just lead you in this, and then we're gonna stand together, and you're gonna take your wife's hand, put your arm around, maybe you fought even coming here. Forget about that. I want you to pray this prayer every day this week. God, would you give me your heart and your mind for Susan so that I treat her with your understanding instead of my own. In Jesus' name. I believe that's a prayer that God really wants to answer in your marriage. And so if your spouse is here, grab the hand, put an arm around or whatever, let her know, I'm gonna be praying that this week. For some of you who maybe aren't married or whatever, you can be thinking of a relationship right now that you go, that, uh, that would work. And so I want you to pray it out loud with me right now. And when we come to my spouse, you put the name in there. All right? Are you ready? Here we go. God, would you give me your heart and your mind for Susan 
so that I treat her with your understanding instead of my own. In Jesus' name. Can you say amen to that? Can you give God praise for what he did here today? God bless you guys. Listen, you need prayer for anything, you come on down. We'll pray with you. You keep praying for Susan. We see a surgeon tomorrow. We'll kind of let you know where we go from there. We're hoping just for the best. And uh, we appreciate all the prayers that have been going on. Uh, But I want to really, you invite some folks to come with you next week, okay? I'm going to get very vulnerable. And we're going to talk about some really, really powerful things that are going to help your marriage, okay? God bless you. Have a great week, guys. Thanks, Emily.